Hello Woody Nook, welcome here. I am Pastor Dana. I'm Chad. We are glad that you are here and we have missed seeing you, so welcome. We hope that by now you have found our newsletter outlining the ways that we are going to do and try to do ministry um, during this time. If you haven't, you can find it on the bridge or on our website, which is woodynook.ca. What we're going to be doing now is providing you with a bit of a home service. So we hope that you've invited, uh, gathered some friends or family together in a small group, of course, uh, abiding by Alberta Health Services or whatever the restrictions are in your particular area uh, to make sure that we don't spread COVID. But this is a way for us to, to still gather together and have some kind of a service together. We're not doing a traditional service at this time where we simply provide you with an entire package service because we want this to be participatory, much like you would if you came to our service here. We want you to participate in some way, shape, or form. And so we've given you uh, a link to, there should be a link below, which contains an outline with a liturgy that you can follow as we go along. There's also some closed captioning, hopefully available, just in case we go a little too quickly or for other reasons the audio isn't all that great. We also ask that you get the bulletin and uh, be ready to use that during our time of prayer together. We are also going to ask you to pause the video at certain moments and you'll see those moments in your service outline and we'll invite you to do that in the videos. Um, once you pause it, there will be some responsive readings in your service outline that you can follow along. So we ask that before you begin, um, that you ask a few people or one person to lead the confession, the call to worship, the assurance of pardon, um, and do that before you begin, whether that's an old person, a young person, cranky person, etc. Now, we recognize that this might feel a little bit awkward where we're asking you to do a lot of things that our worship leaders would do within our service together, but we are all worship leaders together and we just invite you to step out of your comfort zone a little bit, to maybe do something a little bit awkward, experience something of what the early church might have had to experience as they gathered in houses together. And now begins our formal start, I guess. We're finished our announcements. So welcome here. We're glad you're with us and though we are scattered in many different places in many different living rooms around central Alberta and perhaps even the world, uh, we still know that God gathers us together, meets with us, speaks with us, and calls us his beloved. And so we gather with that knowledge. It is in Christ that we live, move, and have our being. And we know that we are still a part of God's Christ's body, whether we are in a church building or not. There have been times when we have celebrated communion in which we say something along the lines of, like the grains that are gathered from many fields into one loaf, and like the grapes from many vines gathered into one cup, so we are gathered from many places into one body. We are the body of Christ wherever we find ourselves. And so today we gather in that knowledge with the people around the world who are also gathering together to worship and affirm our faith in Christ in this moment together. And so gathered as God's people, may we receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now invite you to pause the video for a little bit and speak the call to worship and sing some of the songs. We've linked some for you in the order of worship if you want to have those playing and sing along with them or if you have some other favorites that you'd like to sing together, feel free to do that now. Welcome back. We recognize that in our world and in this time, there is much that we are carrying as we um, understand what's going on in the world and as we deal with the implications of COVID-19. And so we want to pray together. At a certain point, I'll ask you to pause the video and we ask that in your homes you pray for the requests listed in the bulletin or anything else that might be on your mind. Once you're finished, you can pause the video 
or you can continue pausing the video and read the blurb about the offering and if you have kids with you we encourage you to sing the children's blessing especially because they are appropriate words in our time so let us pray together Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pause in your presence, gathering all of who we are, knowing that you see and love us as we are. We trust and are grateful that you hold us and this world in your hands and in your loving presence. We trust that you care for us, that you are generous towards us, and that you provide for us. And though there is much going on, there is also much to be grateful for. So we thank you for our lives and all their complexity and interconnectedness. Thank you for people committed to doing and working in places we cannot. For science and medicine and governments trying to work for the common good. For moments of beauty, deep joy, connectedness with others. For the small graces like birds that chirp, snows that sparkle, technology that works, video games that are fun, and coloring sticks that are awesome. We thank you too for work that is still to be done and things still to be learned, for the rhythms that are keeping us afloat in this time, for our health and people checking in on us. We are grateful. And so we ask that you continue to open our eyes to the wonderful things still available to us. Continue to grow in us joy and hope as we live in isolation together. God, we know you call us into new ways of living in our world. And so even during this time, give us creativity to know how to be your hands and feet in this world. May we risk giving and find you are generous, risk loving and find we are loved, risk forgiving and find we're forgiven, risk being present and find healing, risk vulnerability and find we are cared for, all so that as we risk and find treasures as a result, we can bring your presence and love into all the places we find ourselves this week. Give us eyes to see those who need help, comfort, assurance, and just us to say hello. Jesus, you are the great high priest who knows our struggles, and so we bring before you our concerns, feelings, anxieties, fears, and struggles. Meet us there in the midst of them. There is so much in this world that is going on right now, and we sometimes, if we are honest, don't know how to pray. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would pray on our behalf. We pray for those struggling with the impacts of COVID-19 here and around the world, those who are underemployed or unemployed, Seniors, those living with immune systems not functioning at their best. Leaders and employers that have made a tough and life-altering decisions or who still have to make them. Kids who are now at home and not sure what to do with everything going on and no longer getting to see their friends. Those living alone and those who are living with people who are mean to them and need to isolate. Those with depression, anxiety, worry, and fear that overwhelms. Give them and us what we stand in need of. Do what only you can. Bring comfort, healing, reminders of your love, people to walk with them, courage, peace, joy, and hope. We pray too for healthcare workers and medical professionals, scientists, for leaders and governments as they try to help us through this all. Grant them wisdom, courage, and strength. We long for healing it for our world, ourselves, and the people around us. Heal our world, O oh God. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Lead us through this. God who meets us in the dark and in the light, we know that there is no place you are not. And so we trust that we belong to you, that you are in our midst, and that there is life to be had, even now. We now invite you to pray at home for the things you know about and the people in the bulletin. So welcome back. At this point, we're going to read our scripture and to go through a time where we reflect on this passage a little bit, continue our series where we're going through this uh, walking with Jesus towards the cross. And we think about were we with him or were we there as he encountered different things, as we think about different people, especially. And so join me in this prayer of illumination before we read our scripture. Creator, now lamb to be slain, help us to listen, so that this scripture will not be worship wallpaper, but rather a wake-up call to wisdom, wonder, and transformation. Help us to hear your word. Give us the grace to respond in faithful obedience. Amen. 
So our scripture for this time, whatever time it is that you're reading this, our scripture is from Mark chapter 14. We'll be looking at verses 43 to 52. It's on page 1156 in my Bible. Not sure where it is for you. And so just as he, that is Jesus, was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. And with him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, The one that I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. And then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then everyone deserted him and fled. And a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. And when they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. This is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. So Dana's going to take off and have some candies. She's not used to being able to have a snack during our sermon time. I feel free to do the same. Grab a candy as we dig into this passage a little bit. As we've been following Jesus to the cross, today we're going to take a closer look at Judas. Last week, we looked at how Jesus was going to be betrayed, how he prophesied that someone that was in his group was going to betray him. And we thought about the ways in which that might exist within us as well. How we as individuals often betray Jesus in certain ways by forgetting about him or not, call, not following through on the things that we know he's asking us to do. But we started this series with the woman pouring perfume on Jesus' feet, anointing him for what he says is his burial. We saw how she took the role of a prophet, recognized his value, recognized that the things that he is going to do showed that he was going to give his life, and how Jesus honored her even while other people were upset. If you look back at Mark chapter 14, verse 4, some of those who were present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, John actually names this voice as Judas himself. If you look at John chapter 12, verse 6, John says that Judas did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. See, as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So John says that Judas was concerned not with actually giving this money to the poor, but that he had started to take some of that money for himself. As the treasurer of the group, his desire for treasure for himself overcame his love for Jesus and his fellow disciples and he started to keep a little bit and started to hoard some and use it for his own things. And in fact, Mark says that it was that event, that event of the waste so-called of perfume and his lost opportunity to have some of that money for himself that caused Judas to turn against Jesus. If you look back at Mark 14 verse 10, Mark says that then, after this event, Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus. They were delighted to hear this, and they promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now, there might have been other motivations for why Judas was willing to betray Jesus. We don't really know, but the Bible seems to imply that money was at least a large part of the motivation for Judas. And I think this is a really good example of how money can actually influence or draw us away. The power of money to corrupt. 
And we don't always talk about money as having a power in and of itself. And I think when we see in this passage, we actually see a number of evil forces or a number of spiritual forces that are kind of colluding with individuals in the story and they're gathering to put an end to Jesus. And money, I think, is one of these. Now, whether we actually define it as a spiritual force or not, there are ways in which we talk about economic forces as having some kind of force that exists outside of ourselves. We talk about how things happen outside of our control, how how these economic forces are separate from ourselves as in, and sometimes even as if we are subject to them as if we have to do things in business certain way because well that's just the way that business is done that's the way that our economy operates and that's how we have to do things we know it's not quite right but well maybe that's just the way that business is and that's just the economics of the economic reality that we deal with But the system as a whole seems to be rather broken, as we see maybe 15% of our population consumes around 80% of the total production of consumer goods in our world. That just doesn't seem right and fair. And we actually see Jesus pushing back against this kind of operation all the time. He talks about how we need to share with one another, how we have to look after those who are poor and who don't have as much as we do. The community that was founded by him seems to share, at least at the beginning, and make sure that nobody is goes without and has any need. Jesus seems to call into question that kind of organizing. And it seems as though Judas's love of money causes him to betray the one he loves and actually betray him with a symbol of love. If you look at verse 44... Mark 14, verse 44, the betrayer, Judas, had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. And that word for kiss is actually a derivative of the Greek word phileo, which is a word that describes love. And so this is an action of love that he has twisted into an action of betrayal because his love for money was so much stronger. Jesus actually warns us of this in Matthew chapter 5, we see, or Matthew chapter 6, rather, verse 24. Jesus says that no one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you're devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, Jesus says. So I wonder sometimes in the ways in which we might be complicit with the economic realities of our world or with the power of money in order to do things in our world, in order to lead us astray in certain ways. Now, as Jesus is speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appears, and with him is a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, I wonder sometimes why the religious leaders were so eager to get rid of Jesus. And I think this leads us into this second spiritual force that is gathering against Jesus and that the religious leaders are then colluding with. And it's this desire for power or for influence. We see this in John chapter 11, John 11 verse 45. Now what has just happened before is Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead and a lot of people are then going to believe in Jesus. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary because her brother Lazarus had died and they had seen what Jesus did, raising Lazarus from the dead, they believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and they told them, the Pharisees, what Jesus had done. And then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council in Jerusalem or of the temple at that time. What are we accomplishing? They asked, here is this man performing many signs, and if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and they assume then will start to rebel against the Romans, and then the Romans will come, and they will take away both our temple and our nation. And implicit in this is if the temple and the nation are taken away, then their influence and their rule is also taken away. The Romans have allowed them to rule the temple as they see fit. 
The Romans have given them religious freedoms. They've allowed them to practice their religion and has protected their rights in certain ways. And afraid that that influence might be taken away, they oppose what God is actually doing. And their desire to protect what they thought God wanted them to do, they were willing to sacrifice the one that was actually doing God's will. If you look at verse 49, one of them, named Caiaphas, who was actually acting high priest that year, spoke up. He says, you know nothing at all. You don't realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He actually declared what God was going to do, not realizing that they were complicit with the spiritual forces seeking to eliminate Jesus. In their quest for power and influence, they collude with Judas in his quest for fortune and they arrest Jesus. I wonder sometimes in the ways that we might collude with that power for influence or that, that force for power or influence. What ways do we sacrifice the things that we know God is calling us to in order to achieve more influence or power in our culture. The really interesting thing is that Jesus doesn't stand up to these. He challenges these forces, but he doesn't resist. If you look back at Mark 14, verse 48, we see Jesus say, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Now Jesus challenges their motives and in effect, in essence holds a mirror up to them and says, Look at what you're doing. I've been around all the time, and now here in the dark of night, afraid that you might lose your power or seeking more money, you're willing to sacrifice me for this. Do you realize and do you really see what you are doing? He challenges them and their collusion with these forces, but he does go on and he does allow these forces to have their way with him. Then everyone deserts Jesus and flees. Now, this leads us, I think, to a third force, and this might be a little more subtle in our world. We're used to talking about money and power, but here we see a desire for self-preservation or a desire for self-interest that works against what God is doing. Jesus longs to have people there with him. He asks his disciples to pray for him, and then in the hour of need, they all fall asleep, and now as he's arrested, they all flee. One young man actually flies away naked because they grabbed a hold of his, his clothing and he doesn't want to be caught. This desire for self-preservation, for self-centeredness, or this self-interest has caused them to abandon Jesus. Now, this is a more subtle danger, but one I think that is especially powerful in times of crises. And I think we see glimpses of this now as this pandemic starts to sweep across the world as people start to hoard and consume all kinds of different things as they start to buy up all of the hand sanitizers and toilet paper in certain places in order to gain a little bit of money for things or simply just to have it for themselves so that they know that they are going to be looked after while not really thinking about the other. We see this sometimes too in the ways that people think that maybe they're not going to get sick, so they don't care if they're going to spread it to others. So it's this sense of, of self-interest and self-centeredness that isn't as conscious of how our actions influence or impact other people. So in summary, we've kind of had three forces so far, or in this passage. We've seen this desire for money, this desire for power and influence, and this desire for self-protection has led into Jesus being left alone and arrested and on his way to his own death. So I invite you to take a pause for a couple of moments, go through the first few questions or this first section of questions in the sheet that is at the end of the liturgy. Think about the ways in which maybe you have seen these forces in play in the world and maybe some of the ways that you have colluded with them as well. So welcome back. 
We've seen here in these three forces that Jesus, while he challenges them, he also submits to them. Jesus says that the scriptures must be fulfilled, and he then is led away. And while he allows them to have their way with them, he knows that that's not the end. He knows that his coming death and resurrection is actually going to disarm these forces. So we see this actually in what Paul says to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Paul says that when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, so when you were separated from God, God made you alive with Christ. This new life is given to us just as new life came on the other side of the grave. He forgave all of our sins, those things that kept us away from God, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemns us. He took it away from us by nailing it to the cross above Jesus. And then, and this is the important part, and then having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus makes a public spectacle because he disarms them. He takes away the one thing, actually, that gives them all of their power. It's that threat of death is the only thing or the final thing that they can use to enforce their way and their rule in the world. Jesus' death disarms these powers because it takes away their greatest threat. If death is no longer the end, end, then the threat of death from an empire or from a world that is seducing us and telling us that we won't have a good life if we don't have all of the money like other people do, or or one that tells us we need to have power and influence to guard ourselves and those we love from other people that want to put us to death. If death is not the end, then the need for self-preservation also no longer triumphs or trumps our need to care for one another. Jesus' triumph over death led and leads to a new community that is no longer ruled by these forces. We see this in the early church as they shaped themselves around the resurrection and the new life that comes from them, how they shared their resources with one another, how they cared for the poor and they looked after the sick, how they actually used and served rather than seeking influence themselves, and how they weren't as conscious or cautious about their own self-interest, and they were more interested in caring for and looking after others. We actually see this in some of the ways that they served during the various plagues uh, throughout the Roman Empire within those first 300 years that the Christianity was an illegal religion. So much so that actually Julian the Apostate wrote to some of his pagan priests that they should be more like Christians or more like the atheists, as he calls them, because they didn't follow the Roman gods. In a letter that he wrote to Ersasius, I don't know how to say that necessarily, Emperor Julian says this. He says, atheism, or the Christian faith, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. See, during so many of these plagues, many of the people would just up and leave the cities, and they would just let people die in the streets. They wouldn't care if they rotted. They did not look after them. They'd leave loved ones behind because they were so afraid for their own safety. But it was the Christians that stayed behind, many often falling and succumbing to the same diseases, but they were caring for the sick, and they were actually burying the dead. It's a scandal Julian says that there's not a single Jew who is a beggar and that these godless Galileans, the ones that follow Jesus, care not only for their poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. So there was this recognition that Christians actually did care for one another, that they gave service to the poor and that they were willing to give of themselves in ways that overcame their own self-interest. Now this doesn't mean, as we think of the ways that this implies for us, that we put ourselves in harm's way, but it does mean that we need to think more carefully about how we interact with others and how we might be willing to, to put ourselves out for other people. 
And in a lot of ways, many of us are doing that already by canceling our services or by staying home and self-isolating. But maybe there's other ways that we can do so. And so I invite you at this moment to sit down, to pause this video, and to think through those questions together, that question number two and those ones that are following there. How Jesus' death and resurrection frees us from their powers and creates a new community through them. So take a moment now to discuss that together. Welcome back. The spiritual forces of evil, evil gathered against Jesus, and the religious leaders Judas and the disciples were complicit in their attack against him. But Jesus' death and resurrection disarms these powers and creates a new community, no longer enslaved to money, to influence, or to self-preservation at all costs. But it creates a community that is willing to share, willing to serve, and willing to care. So may we continue to learn how to be that kind of community. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this incredible glimpse into the ways in which we can be led astray, but also how we get to see in Jesus a new community that fights these forces, one that is no longer enslaved to them. And as we think about how we as a community can live into this this willingness to share, to care, and even to sacrifice. We pray that we would be known as people who are willing to do that, even by those who claim to be our enemies. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now that our sermon is finished, we'll invite Dana to come back. And as she comes back, we'll join together in a blessing or a time together. We invite you to pause the video, to play the song, There Ain't No Grave. I'm not sure if it's a song you're familiar with. This is a Christian version, which is great, um, but it's a song in which we, we testify to the power of the resurrection and how there's no grave that can hold us down. To join together in reading the confession, and lament, and the assurance of pardon that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. And when you're finished, then please join us again. As we journey on together in this world and try to figure out what it means to be this community, we want to bless you on your way and in your journey of that. So receive God's parting blessing to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace and all God's people say. Amen. Amen. And as you may notice at the end of the liturgy, there's a, a list or there's a, a blessing there that we have provided for you to bless one another with. We invite you to awkwardly look into one another's eyes as you sit around the table and give this blessing to each other, recognizing that we do, as priests and as prophets and kings, we can bless each other too as we gather together. And at the end of this, we invite you to sing the doxology together, praising God for all the blessings that he has given to us. And if you liked this video, we ask that you would please subscribe and maybe even hit the bell down below so you'll be notified when new ones show up next week. It was lovely to be with you today in spirit, and we hope that you are doing well. And know that if you need anything, whether that's physical, emotional, spiritual, anything, please let us know, your elders know, or your deacons know. We would love to hear from you. Peace.